Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar. Um, I'm Georgie, a member of the industry marketing team here at House, and together with me is Harry, one of our top account executives, um, to provide you with the latest news, insights and to answer any questions throughout and after the webinar. Hi guys, it's Harry from House. I've been with um, many different roles within the platform and actually seeing House grow, um, so hopefully I can answer any questions you may have today. So for today's session, we'll be discussing how you can sell bolder design choices to your homeowners. Just for a little housekeeping before we get started, our session is moderated. So if you have any questions, please submit them through the chat feature, which you can find on the lower right hand side of your window. If we don't have time to get to your question, our team will follow up with you directly after the session. Um, great. OK, so you should be able to see the title slide on your screen um, so we can get started. So today we're taking a look at ways to push your clients out of their comfort zones and help them make bolder choices that they may have otherwise been hesitant to explore. As you probably experienced, working with your prospects and clients, it can sometimes be challenging to help them envision the end results that you're confident will make them happy in the long run. Professionals in the home design and renovation industry, whether you've been in the business for years or just starting out, tend to be more visual by nature. You can see and reimagine things that others maybe can't, and ultimately that's why home and homeowners seek out your guidance and talent. But if the homeowner you're working with lacks the same sense of imagination or inspiration, or they have a very specific preference and can't see past it, there's an opportunity for you to add more, even more value by helping them evaluate their project to the next level. So how can you do that? What are some of the ways you can motivate homeowners to be more open-minded and trust your experience and expertise? First, we'll talk about some ways that you can introduce your ideas early in the consultation process. There's a fine balance between demonstrating your ability to help them design their dream space and overwhelming them with options that can make them feel like you're pushing their boundaries too far, too fast. Once you've established a good rapport with your clients and earned their trust, then we'll explore techniques that can be persuasive for different types of decision makers. Finally, we'll look at tools and resources available to help you communicate your ideas and provide something tangible that you can help your clients visualise your design. And we want to make it as easy as possible for homeowners to see what you see and motivate them to embrace your design concept. In previous webinars, we've talked about how to get prospective clients to call you back. It's about responsiveness, persistence and a really good contact strategy. So great news, they called you back and it's time to put your sales hats on. You're selling your services, talent, experience, and most importantly, your ability to connect with these homeowners. The following techniques can help make sure that once you've got the proverbial foot in the door, you have an opportunity to present your proposal. Establish a good rapport and speak their language. It's important to avoid making a conversation about yourself, your business, your service, and the benefits of working with you. Talk about them, their needs, their values, and preferences. By focusing your attention on your client's objectives, you have an opportunity to connect with them. This helps them believe that you have their best interests in mind. Next, prepare a well-conceived structured pitch that also introduces the client to some of out-of-the-box ideas. Home renovation experts recommend the following seven step plan. Reiterate what you believe is most relevant to your homeowners. That may be design, function, materials, or cost. Then state the conclusion you reached. For example, you might say something like, since I know cost is a high priority, I would recommend going with stock cabinetry and an engineered countertop. When you make your recommendation, be as articulate as possible. When presenting a proposal, less is often more. For example, I want to give, you, give your project a high-end finish while staying within a budget you're comfortable with. So you'll see in the design that I, I'm combining custom features and quality stock products. Then communicate how your recommendation is captured in the design. This is also a great opportunity to gradually introduce bolder design elements into the conversation. For instance, I'd like to add crown moulding along the tops of the cabinet boxes, designer grade knobs and pulls on the doors and drawers and finish with custom baseboards. To add some visual interest, we could get creative with a painted backsplash made of inexpensive plywood. Show the benefits of your specific ideas and clearly explain your recommendation. You can save substantial amounts on the, on the cabinetry, but still offer that designer look and feel. That leaves room for your budget to include new appliances. Afterwards, state the takeaway for your client. You might begin wrapping up with something like, I've shared an idea book with you that has a few examples of projects I've done like this in the past. 
flip through and see if there's anything that really attracts your attention. And then finally, restate the objectives of your proposal to finish the presentation. I feel confident that we can give your dream space within the budget you had in mind. There are some really great off-the-shelf materials that we can work with, and then my job will be to create those designer-inspired finishes that will give you the custom look at a fraction of the price. Engage persuasive te selling techniques. Okay, so you've engaged the client, they're on board with the project, and now you're really diving into the design. At this point, you're probably also getting a feel for the type of client you're working with. Over the course of two years, a research firm published by the Harvard Business Review around decision-making styles of 1,600 executives across a wide range of industries. They identified five key groups, which I'll go into in a moment. It's important to note that these aren't intended to dictate your sales strategy, but rather to offer some insights that might help you be, more, be a more persuasive seller. Charismatics. So the first group is what's defined as the charismatics. They love new ideas, absorb information quickly, and tend to process visually. This person might show a lot of excitement and enthusiasm, but might be challenged to make a decision because they need to see the bottom line and evaluate options very methodically. For the charismatic, keep your proposal grounded in reality and focus on the results. When you're looking to persuade them to embrace something outside their comfort zone, use visual aids to stress the, the features and benefits of the idea. And be straightforward without the potential risks which can gain the client's trust because they know you're considering them too. Let's say, for example, that you're proposing to a charismatic client an open floor plan on the ground floor that requires moving walls and entrances. They may be excited about the idea, but need to see a rendering of the concept, evaluate all the potential hidden costs associated, and examine structural considerations before moving forward. Architect and designer Carol Kerr even had to use tools to win over a client who was open-minded to begin with. She told me this. I had a client who wanted to include lots of innovative high, high design aspects in her redesign project, but had a hard time visualizing. She had a pair of authentic arm Jacobson egg chairs that we wanted to keep, but the leather was cracked and needed to be replaced. I had the idea to reupholster the chairs in a green color to match the lawn visible of the outside windows. Before presenting the idea, I looked for leather swatches, bought paint chips, and got in contact with a leather maker to see if they could do a custom color. When I presented the idea to her, she was initially shocked at the idea of changing the color to something bold. But after about 10 minutes, she said, let's do it. I've learned that when presenting a design, you really have to listen and gauge the client's reaction. Pay attention to their body language and hesitation to understand what's holding them back. If a client is really bella boring a decision, it means it's not right. This second group is called the thinkers. These people are often described as intelligent, logical, and academic. They're also often the most difficult to persuade because of their aversion to risk. They often have an analytical approach to decision making, so they'll likely appreciate comparative data. If it's applicable, that might include market, market research or a cost-benefit analysis. Since thinkers categorically like to know the risks up front, you might have a better chance of persuading them if you call attention to those first. The recommendation is to install a moving glass wall that opens to the home's exterior creating an extended outdoor living space. A client who might be classified as a thinker might benefit from things like a cost analysis, comparing with other sliding door systems, or examples of how this luxury feature might add value to the home itself, both in functionality and property value. The thinker will also probably want to know what else they might have to take into consideration if they go this route, particularly things they might not know even to ask. For example, in my own personal home renovation project, I wanted to open up a wall and install French doors. The contractor I worked with walked me through the permit process so that I understood and added time to my project. He also let me know in advance that what permits and regulations I needed to know about were, and they would be required to make sure other features in my home were up to the most recent code as well. So for example, by adding the doors, I knew I was going to have an upgrade of all my fire alarms. Understanding these potential risks can help a thinker feel like they're making the most educated and informed decision possible. Tammy Smite shares how she convinces clients. I had a couple who needed to redo their master bathroom. The wife wanted a complete renovation, but the husband wanted to do a refresh since the bathroom was functional. I educate my clients about the what ifs and why to a project. We had a great discussion about what the bathroom is now and what it could be. I asked about what the goals are for the space and how the clients wanted to feel when the space was finished. 
I showed the client's images on house and the cost of bids for a renovation versus a refresh and let them discuss privately so that they could decide. Now, let's talk about the skeptics. Your skeptics are exactly as they sound, highly suspicious of things that might challenge their views. A common characteristic among so-called skeptics is that they tend to have very strong personalities. They might come across as demanding, disagreeable, or even antisocial. They might be combative and take charge, acting a lot on their feelings. Persuading a skeptic requires credibility. That might be through certifications you've earned, reviews from previous clients you've worked with, or even professional references. The good news is that skeptics often want to move forward with new ideas, as long as they trust the person recommending them. For example, if you're trying to convince a skeptic as a traditional log fireplace that it's installing a gas fire is a great way to modernize a room, show them installed example on house and how it transforms the space. For additional credibility, you could share photos from a project you've worked on recently. Joanne Jacob shares practical strategies she's used, she uses to interpret client thoughts on her designs. She says, it's often difficult for people to share their hopes and dreams. Most clients have developed a language that doesn't always give specific actionable answers like, I love it or it's expensive, which can't be quantified. So I employ a one to 10 number system. One is no and 10 is love and five is tolerate. Each decision maker assigns a number to specific design elements. This opens up a deeper and richer dialogue, allowing my clients to feel better heard. Using a numerical strategy takes the emotion out of the conversation. This framework is a jumping off point for a rational conversation, instead of getting derailed by strong feelings. The fourth category is defined as followers. These are people who make decisions based on how they've made decisions in the past. Because they're afraid of making the wrong choice, they're generally not early adopters. They trust known reputable brands and are generally cautious and risk averse. Generally, if they've seen something done elsewhere, they'll tend to agree to a recommendation. Followers can be the easiest to persuade and with the right strategy. Make them feel confident that others have followed your recommendation in the past and seen success. Let's say you recommend artificial turf to the homeowner's garden. He thinks it looks fake and unattractive. If you're working with someone you've identified as a follower, it might be helpful to drive them to a previous project. You can always speak to how the homeowners you've worked with are saving money on maintenance, less watering and no mowing. Chris of CV and Associates told us, we try to calm clients' fears before they sign the contract with change orders. We like to push the edge of the envelope first with our ideas, then scale back slowly as needed. We take clients to homes or sites where they can see a proposed design scheme or elements work working together successfully. Then they can make up their own minds. The fifth and final decision maker is the controller. Controllers are often described as logical, detail-orientated, analytical, and objective. They tend to have strong personalities, even coming across as overbearing at times. Very often, they make unilateral decisions and seldom listen to other people's input. When trying to persuade a controller to accept a new or innovative idea, make your argument structured, linear, and credible. Be prepared to answer many questions and provide detailed information. In the end, let them feel like they're making the choice to move forward. A great way to present to a controller is with, the, with what creative strategists refer to as the rule of three. Offer three distinct recommendations that the decision maker can evaluate. Client's choice. This is generally described as what the client asks for with a moderate amount of designer influence. It's not boring, but it's not challenging the client either. Pro's choice. This is what you would describe as your best solution. It's a highly creative solution that balances your unique ideas with the client's needs. The wow effect. This is where you can let your skills and knowledge fly. This option challenges the client and really expands their horizons. All three instances allow you to put your own stamp on the proposals to varying degrees. They also provide your client with reasonable options that they can choose from and even customize. Particularly for your controller, you're dictating the concepts by letting the client feel like they're making the decision. Susan Winterstein has another approach for providing options. She says, typically I'll provide two choices. I'll tell the client that one selection is based on their current comfort zone. It's safe, it's conservative, but the other choice is a bit more out of the box and custom to their space. It's like it came out of a catalog. It will reflect the custom design space. Meg Waldrop of Trinity Build and Design shares her experience giving the client options. I was hired to restore a 1920s Tudor, but I had to judge the homeowner's desires for large rustic Tuscan features. I figured out that instead of saying no, 
I got better results by finding really spectacular alternatives. When she wanted everything to be brown and beige, I presented the palette of warm greys and espresso. And when she wanted oil rubbed bronze on everything, I showed her the blackest oil rub fixtures I could find. I had to remember that she wasn't capable of seeing the vision the same way we are. She was scared to change because she couldn't visualize it. But when she actually saw it, she never looked back. So now we've identified decision-making styles, let's talk about some of the tools and resources you can use to encourage your clients to take a chance on some of the, your bolder design ideas. As you know, presenting a detailed mock-up of your ideas helps clients see how all of the features will come together. New tools are making this, these design presentations more sophisticated than relying on traditional methods like paint chips and fabric samples assembled together. You can take advantage of this technology with a variety of visual tools. House has, has some options. For example, a house idea book can help show homeowners successful examples from other projects. And if you're looking for products on the house shop, Sketch can create a 2D image of the items. For even more powerful imagery, View in My Room 3D on, on the house app will use virtual reality to give clients a sense of how a specific item would fit in the space. 3D renderings are another option to give clients a comprehensive view of a transformation. With many different rendering softwares programs available, pros can provide differing levels of detail. And many pros choose to outsource renderings to a freelancer or provider. Or if they're skilled in computer-aided drawing, they can produce renderings themselves. When homeowners see what the final results will look like, they will often feel more confident about moving forward with the proposal. They can be especially helpful if you're proposing something that the homeowners haven't seen. Michelle Armstrong shares her success in using visual tools. She says, in home staging, we try to create the illusion of a lifestyle for potential clients. The sketch is a great tool to help my clients visualize the illusion. Prior to using sketch, I would make a trifold board with wallpaper samples, paint chips, and tile samples, but cl clients didn't really get the vision. With sketch, the clients often love the initial vision and make decisions faster. And since discovering sketch, I've used it with every client. Another tip is to use tangible items that clients can put in their space to help in their decision-making process. If a client seems unsure about including a design element, ask if they're willing to consider letting you place a sample item or a material in their home for a period of time so they can see if they can envision it there longer term. Interior design Lisa Bell shares her experience using tools to convince a client. She says, I had a couple who wanted to stick with a white kitchen while my design proposed black and gold elements in fixtures, trims, pools, plumbing fixtures, and light fixtures. The client felt that the gold was dated. I showed them renderings and actual cabinet pools and a finished material sample. The clients eventually implemented all of my choices and they're satisfied now with their kitchen. People test drive cars before they make a purchase. They may keep for many years, or they can go to a clothing store and try on a garment and make sure they look, feel, and feel fit. For customers who want to stay in their comfort zone to avoid buyer's remorse, allowing them to so-called test drive aspects of their renovation project might help them come around to something they were initially skeptical about. Now that we've covered our tips on working with clients to expand their comfort zones, review a questionnaire we've developed for you so you can get feedback about your proposed design. When clients have difficulty expressing their thoughts about your design, you can use the following questions to guide the conversation to make it easier. After the clients have had a chance to review the design, sit down with them and work through the following questions. The first question is, what appeals to you about the design and why? This question will start off on a positive note and get them thinking about where they already agree with your design. Asking why they like something will give you a deeper information about their tastes, which you can keep in mind when making other suggestions. Because it's an open-ended question, the client may give you broader feedback. The second question is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like the elements that you like in the design and want to implement? By using this method, you can quantify your client's feelings about the design. That way, if they give a high score, like a 9 or a 10, you know they're truly satisfied. But if they give a score like a 6 or a 7, you know there's an opportunity to shape the design to improve their experience. The third question is, what is less or unappealing to you about the design and why? This question will help categorize anything the client does not care for so you know what to omit in the design and in other suggestions. By asking why, it gives the client a chance to explain themselves, 
including things they may not have realised were important to them when you did initial client intake. The fourth question is, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you dislike those elements that you do not want to keep? Like asking about the positive elements in the design, you'll be able to quantify how much the client dislikes the elements. If the client's ratings are drastically negative compared to just moderate dislike, they may indicate something is truly not to their liking compared to something they simply aren't used to. And the final question is, are there elements that you like but just don't see working in your own, own home? And which elements? This question can pinpoint if something in the design is out of the client's comfort zone. Maybe the client added many photos of industrial style rooms to their idea books, only to realise she might not think the urban loft feel will work in her home. Or it can reveal if that they believe something won't align with their lifestyle. For example, perhaps the client likes the idea of a white area rug in the living room, but fears he won't be able to keep it clean with his kids and pets. Whatever the homeowner responds to this question, you can see if it's worthwhile to make your point or if it's best to find a workaround. Now that we've covered everything on the agenda, Harry will answer some questions from the audience that have come in. And after that, we'll be taking you through some updates and news from Howes. I see I've got a question here from Isabella who asks, in the feedback questionnaire, why do we have to repeatedly ask why the client does or does not like something in the design? Thanks for asking, Isabella. The strategy behind asking why the client does or does not like something is you can reveal the deeper feelings or if anything possible, uh, any, sorry, any possible objections they may have. By uncovering the meaning why the client doesn't want to improve certain elements of the design, you can more effectively move forward with the next draft. Asking variations of the similar questions can help generate deeper feedback that um, illustrates how the client really feels, and it could be helpful to guide the communication between multiple decision makers. Hopefully that helps. See another question, we've got another question from Victor, who asks, how many design options should I present? What's the right balance between too few and too many? That's a great question. We've heard from designers who present just one option to the clients with the intention to modify it based on the client's feedback. However, presenting just one option makes it you know, easier for the clients to see, to take it or leave it type of situation. Meaning if they don't love the first design, they could choose not to move forward with it. Um, the trick is to give the clients enough choice that they feel they have more freedom with their design. Yeah, so, um, and then obviously the feedback we get from our designers in the community is that, you know, presented one status quo option um, that limits their choices. Our rule of three could be just strategy to try. But beyond three options, the client may feel overwhelmed by the amount of options or require more round of revisions to finalise the plan if they want to include elements from different presentations. Right, so another question we've got. Alison threw a question asking, I find it hard to convince clients to take, as you phrase it, bolder choices who have not seen my work in person or have a friend whose home I've helped with. How can I work around this? You'll find that 90% of the traffic on house goes to the photo stream. So it's extremely important uh, to have beautiful images of your work. Having these great images can really give a true reflection of your business. Uh, but more important than photos is going to be the reviews. It's the number one hiring criteria on house. It will help you stand out against your competitors. And, you know, it's what our homeowners really care about. You want the customer to feel at ease, you know, when they're hiring you. Um, we all do it when we order products online or any kind of service or even films and, you know, meals at a restaurant. We're always inclined to try to check the reviews. So having a well-built up profile, you know, full of great images, five-star reviews, set a level of expectation of cost. Um, and obviously giving the story behind your business um, will obviously allow your potential client to have all the information they need to make a decision if it's going to be a right fit for them. Hopefully that helps. Um, and a final question before answering the rest at the end of the webinar and the chat function. Um, we do have a good question in the house. So thanks for asking, Phil. I've been interested in house for a while, but can't see, but can't see what makes house so different to other forms of marketing out there. Great question. You know, a lot of people think you know we're very like Pinterest and other forms of marketing out there. Um, but house is not the only leading platform. For, you know, house is the leading platform behind home renovation. But we focus on the branding element of your business more than anything else. You're targeting a relevant and specific audience of your industry. So unlike other platforms, um, sorry, other platforms. We don't want our homeowners just to see a name and number in the directory. We want them to really kind of fall in love with your work, see your brand, and kind of have all the information they need. Um, if you have a you know a list in the directory and it says architect or carpenter, they just assume that's what you do. They don't you know that there's no kind of real kind of visual representation of that. Um, and obviously you know given that consistent exposure will give your brand an identity. 
um, it makes you more authoritative in the market, and a brand that establishes a face um, and maintains that face will develop credibility amongst its competitors and um, it will gain trust in potential clients. So that's all we have time for for the questions. Um, we'll continue to answer them in the chat function. Um, but before we wrap up, I do want to speak about the Pro Plus feature. Lovely. So, um, yeah, so Pro Plus, I don't know if you guys are aware, but it's our local pay program. It allows you guys to be seen thousands of times a month in front of our affluent homeowners for larger selected projects over the years. Um, it's for those that really want to build a brand and kind of take house to the next level. So as you can see on the screen, we've got the five key areas of house. With obviously the Pro Plus, it's really important that we make a consistent presence across all of these. Um, the homeowner journey in the house is those that are looking for inspiration, they're looking for ideas, and then the ideas are coming to life, obviously by either buying products or hiring a professional. Lovely. So the first place we're gonna do this is obviously the photo stream. We need to make sure that your work is consistently seen throughout the photo stream. We reserve spots uh, across the photo stream to make sure that you are seen. We showcase your strongest images because we want to showcase the work that's going to attract more of that type of work. Everyone knows like attracts like. Um, so we get quite creative and then we give you bold branding to highlight what you specialize in and what type of work you want to attract more of. The second place is the directory. The directory is a fantastic place. Uh, we're slowly moving more and more towards the end of the design process now. They're looking for a local pro. We've actually reserved all the even spots for our local professionals, but you will never lose your free international level as well. So sometimes if you target your local area, you'll find that you have two listings, but the predominant aim of this is to make sure when they look in their local area that you're on that first page. And we can do that by limiting who we work with um, because ProPlus is not available to everyone. We have a select number of uh, partners within each geographical area. So we can rotate you amongst these even spots. Project map, so unlike the other two slides that you just saw, um, the photo stream and directory is where your bigger and more larger design their work will come from. They've seen your brand, they've seen your work, they know what you're capable of. So they will hire you directly based on that. With Project Match, it's something we introduced last year to ensure that our home, um, sorry, our, um, our partners are getting a quicker return on investment, um, but they're getting the right type of clients. So that a person will come onto a house with a live project, internally they will fill in a form, they fill in a full scope of work, so then based on that services, as long as it aligns with what you want to offer, we we'll recommend you as a leading professional in that area. So it's a real way to kind of really filter down what type of inquiries come through house, but also a way for someone that's never found you, never seen your work, for their, us to actually recommend you as a leading professional. But all of this is essentially just trying to drive traffic to your profile. Um, mentioned before, the profile is so important. What you'll find is you have a really low click-through rate to your website. The reason being is because you have every bit of information on your on your house profile. You'll have the typical job costs, so setting the level of expectation of cost, your beautiful work to see all the different types of portfolio that you can offer, and then obviously the story of the business and just everything else that comes with the house profile. At the top, you can see where it says bring your project to life for 250, um, and the bold branding above the category. These are essential with the Pro Plus because these are the bold branding and the branding element that will be sponsored across your ads. We keep a very close eye on what comes through in house in many different ways. The account manager will look after your profile. Um, you'll get three types of inquiries on house. You'll get direct messages, your direct, direct telephone calls, which are automatically enabled uh, call tracking. Uh, we introduced this last year as well because we want to keep a cl you know, close eye on those who come through telephone inquiries. And this number will only be advertised on your house profile, nowhere else. So as you can see here, your inbox, so your hot leads, so your project match leads will come through into your inbox as well as direct messages. And also you can see here, you can go into your call log and see what calls and what data have come from the house. On top of that, not only are we tracking calls, we track the number of profile views and you'll get an analytic dashboard covering everything from photos, edit idea book, how many inquiries you had, and you can have a clear representation of your free international listing against your local listing. And then the biggest key selling point about the house program is the account manager. Um, they've been, they, you know, they all come from marketing background. They know house better than anyone else. It's really hard within the industry to kind of, you know, focus on on-site projects and quotes and everything else, and then try and dedicate time to marketing if you don't have an 
an employee to do so. Um, with House, we do that for you. We can run the campaign. They really understand the type of work that you're looking to attract and what direction you're taking the business. You could be looking to increase your digital footprint. You could be looking to expand. Um, you could be looking to take on larger inquiries, more design-led, um, and you know, try and attract a new market. This is the person that's really going to help you. They are your right-hand man. They can do other stuff as well, like obviously uh, upload photos and do all the nitty-gritty bits of marketing. But essentially, they're your marketing guru when it comes to house. So use them wisely. It is a two-way street. You put in as much as you get out. Um, but obviously, having that person here in the London office is fantastic. Lovely. So if you've got any questions, you can obviously contact the email below. Um, but by all means, there's more to the program. It is a full-on partnership with House. Um, but yeah, get in touch if you want to find out more. Cool. Thanks, Harry. Um, and that's all we've got time for um, today. So um, thanks very much for listening. And we will be sending the recording round uh, via email shortly. So uh, make sure you look out for that.